box. Uh, we've got a fireside chat, and then we've got beers. So uh, let me bring up Dr. Robert Drost from Consensus, and he will be talking about ETH2 and uh, going beyond the, the beacon chain. Congratulations to everybody. Um, congratulations to everybody who's made it through the day this far and still has their brain sort of working. Um, I'm going to be going pretty quickly through Ethereum 2 Space 2, which if you've never heard about it before, is a little bit uh, really interesting. Um, so it will be definitely helpful to just sort of watch through the slides and think about what I'm talking about, because it might be even a little mind-blowing. Let's get to the first slide, please. So um, we had good, uh, second slide, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so um, we had good introduction talks this morning from Terrence and Alex about phase zero and phase one, if you were at those, which is really what most people have been hearing about Ethereum 2 so far. I think the interesting point in what I'm talking about here is phase two. Phase two is the actual execution layer of Ethereum 2. And to date, there's not been a lot of public knowledge. There's a bunch of researchers. We've been working on it quite a bit for the last three, five months and made a lot of progress. And so if this is your first introduction to it, you know, yay, I think you're gonna enjoy it a lot. It's actually quite exciting. So to get the right mindset, let me first remind everybody Ethereum 1, what it is at the execution layer. And the critical point there is that it's a hard-coded transaction and execution framework. What, what is state? the state structure, how it's held, all of the things related to transactions and contracts, all of that stuff is embedded in what it means to be a full node and a miner. And you have to actually have all of the state of Ethereum to be a full node and a miner to participate in consensus. So that is what causes any changes in Ethereum 1's consensus to cause a fork. And now we've had many forks in Ethereum so far. Okay, so now next slide. Um, Ethereum 2 is critically different in that it breaks up the composition of the blockchain into a fixed layer, so a bunch of APIs that are really completely defined and will require a fork to change it, and it introduces this really important concept, which are these flexible layers. They're actually called EEs, but it's, that's the layer that's flexible, that's the layer that's programmable, and it's really interesting to kind of recognize, I'm gonna talk pretty much in this talk about what that layer is, so don't worry that it's not explained well enough on this. I'm gonna to try to hit it from like five different angles. So you're gonna hear it again and again and again, and hopefully that'll come back together. Oh, on the first slide I said I'm at RJ Drost. All of these slides I'm gonna put on my Twitter channel in case you want to, Twitter feed, I'm sorry. Um, in case you wanna look through them again later or share them with other people. Um, so, the EE layer, if you can believe it, actually defines what is a transaction. Ethereum 2 does not define what a transaction is. In fact, in Ethereum 2, a UTXO style Bitcoin can be a completely valid transaction. You just have to define an execution environment that can do it. You can define a Zexi environment that operates pretty much at layer one, at like an Ethereum, I'm sorry, at a Ethereum one type level. Um, you can define an identity layer, I'll go through a couple examples. The EE layer, the flexible layer, also defines what is state. So it is possible in Ethereum 2 to actually have execution environments where there's no state period being held. So it's extremely different than Ethereum 1 where it was all very prescriptive about how to do it. Um, so let's keep going here. So if you've known Ethereum 2's development, phase zero, phase one, that's what we all know and love, and the brave new territory, the exciting part that we're getting to now is actually seeing what dApps and contracts are gonna look like. This is a really rough graphic, but I checked it with a bunch of people, and we all sort of agree this is roughly accurate here. That, you know, the beacon chain is 100% fixed. You can't get that, you can't be flexible on that because the algorithm we're using for POS is absolutely critical from the crypto economic security aspect. So it's fixed. Shards are, are somewhat fixed, and they actually are a little bit flexible because parts of the E's are running in there. And then the execution layer is pretty much 100%. What's not sort of shown is there's a kind of a fee market for setting gas prices and stuff, and that actually has some fixed APIs that'll be coming after the E layer in some sense. So just to run through these very, very fast, and I'll get to the meat of it. Phase zero, beacon chain, one ring, one rule, one ring to rule them all. Phase one, shards, this is a graphic I saw more recently that I thought was a bit more fun than some of the old ones.
lines. You, know, you see there the peaking chain uh, in the middle, and it's pointing over to the uh, uh, cross links of the various shards. In phase two, state execution. And it's the one which is utility. It's the one that got me into blockchain. I actually want to run things. I don't really care about you know sharding 32, you know, getting to, uh, ordering 32 byte block uh, routes. I really care about what's actually happening. So, okay, now this is the meat of the talk. What is an execution environment? So, an execution environment is something that it does have to accept the fixed consensus rules of the beacon chain. Okay, those would have to require forks in the future to change if you want to change the number of shards, you want to change the finality threshold, or what have you. But the execution environment critically defines the state transition function. Who here knows, you know, and really feels very comfortable with what the state transition function is? A bunch of, I have a graphic for it in a second. The other thing is execution environment, it is code, it is scripts, but it is not a smart contract. I'll make that point again. It's a new layer that's been introduced in Ethereum 2 that sits above the smart contract layer, if you want to think of it, Ethereum 1, but below the consensus layer. It's kind of at a 1.5 layer, if you want to call it that. And it's expensive to deploy, maybe hundreds or thousands of dollars to deploy execution environments. We don't want them to proliferate like crazy, but they're really powerful. I mean, you can actually take Bitcoin, Sovereign, Hyperledger Fabric, you can take Move, you know, for the Move semantics from Facebook Libra, you can just run them on Ethereum too. I find it really, really exciting. And for people who want to see it mathematically, if you want to see what a state function is, state transition function, because it's so key to the uh, execution environment, it's a pure function, meaning it holds no state. Everything that it computes on is given to it as inputs. So it has the pre-state root, it has the block, which is the transactions and any proofs of data coming in that are required for the transactions, and then it gives a post-state hash. Um, there's a link there for it. Another way to think about it, the graphical aspect is you take the state root in, in Ethereum 1, you have a reducing function where you run all the transactions, you get all the new states, you go through the permission, uh, uh, Merkle patrician tree, you get the new state root at the top of all of it, and you would get the final new S prime uh, with the uh, state hash attached to it. Now in Ethereum 2, it's cut off a little bit at the top there. Sorry about that. Um, I'm just maximizing my use of the slide there. The beacon chain now holds this new layer of execution environment scripts or contracts. And I show an example here of an EAT1 style execution environment in UTXO or a Zexy. And those are running inside of that same beacon chain. And those are defining the state transition functions, and they're defining what transactions mean to be inside of a block in each of those environments. Okay? So I said I was going to repeat things a little bit. Please don't get too annoyed with me on that. Actually, writing it here, you know, an execution environment is not an ETH1 style smart contract. It's, you know, it's written in a base language, it gets compiled down to, in this case, uh, WASM instead of, or eWASM instead of uh, EVM code. What an execution environment is, this is a, probably one of the smallest wordings that I could put together for it. It's an executable definition of transactions, what is state, and a trans transition function for blocks. And that allows you essentially on E2 to be running tens or hundreds of completely different semantic execution environments. So I thought I'd actually make the statement because you know, a lot of the discussions, you don't get a very simple statement and I really think it's valuable to say why you should care about it. Why are execution environments valuable? And the way I viewed it is like why we all got so excited about Ethereum and why Vitalik is just held in such high regard is he saw a proliferation of fixed currency blockchains after Bitcoin that were slightly different protocols, but fundamentally they weren't that different. And Ethereum 1 really abstracted away the fixed semantics of digital tokens and allowed ERC-20s and all sorts of other interesting constructs to happen uh, inside of it. And um, E2, in a similar way now with these execution environments, is abstracting away the fixed execution semantics of other blockchains that are out there. So it's a beautiful progression, I feel. The other really good way to think about it is that the beacon chain, you know, yields, I put in quotes, just tens of thousands, and people kind of lament me. I don't like saying the number's higher, but it's likely to be hundreds of thousands or even millions because there's a lot of scaling that's built into Ethereum 2 beyond just the 1024x factor. The execution environments allows those TPS to be split and shared across tons of conceivable different transaction models. 
And that's the really exciting part. So it's about scaling for Ethereum 2, but it's also about scaling the semantics of the blockchain to be really flexible. We won't get locked in in the way we did with Ethereum 1. Do you need to contribute, or do you need to build an E? And if you're a core developer, the answer is yes. You may have ideas when you learn more about EEs that really fit there. And then you might also find that an application may benefit from a two-level contract hierarchy where you define the transaction state and then you run the contracts inside of it. I think it'll be a really interesting thing to see what happens. If you only build dApps, it, your world's not gonna change a whole lot. You're gonna see dApps are faster. They cost a lot less to deploy. That's gonna be super exciting. It'll be good to learn the new infrastructure. You have some time if you only build dApps. Um, example ease, I'm not going to run through these, let me get to the final slide or two, but it really is the gamut of everything you can think about now, uh, currently. We haven't really seen a limitation on it yet. The really exciting part I can tell you guys about now, if you want to learn more, I have all the links here, or go to, you know, at RJ Drost, um, my Twitter chat, Twitter feed, and you'll see these slides with these links. The Learn Contribute is great. There's a project right now where a team at Consensus R&D called Quilt is collaborating with Sigma Prime Lighthouse Client as well as the EF Scout, which is the runtime environment for Ethereum 2, with the plans to actually stand up a phase two test net towards the end of this year, beginning of next year, pretty much in line with the current plans on the Beacon Chain. And that'll be exciting that it will actually be possible to run dApps uh, in that test net. Um, and putting it graphically, this is my final slide here, is why is the phase two net test net exciting for you? is that we're taking the serial execution of phase two, waiting on phase zero and phase one to be completed, and we're putting it in parallel. So it's a you know awesome thing to think about pulling that much time out of the overall roadmap. So that's a wonderful thing. And I do want to say that uh, Will and Matt from the team actually made almost all these slides, so give them credit. Thank you very much.